Warsaw, just before the Second World War broke out. During the interwar period, there were more Jews in Warsaw than anywhere else in Europe. 380,000 Varsovians were Jews, 30% of the capital city's population at that time. Poles and Jews lived for many years on that same land in the same country. They lived together, side by side. One cannot make simple generalizations about their relationship. Both peoples, whether they were living together or side by side, gradually begin to hear increasingly disturbing rumors about the coming war. But not just yet. War may have been coming ever closer, but it was nevertheless quite distant. Political, cultural, and social life was still in full swing. Just before the war, Warsaw was one of the most important centers of Jewish culture in the world, with an active literary, artistic, musical, and theatrical scene, whose accomplishments were rarely noticed and appreciated beyond the Jewish community. Although plays from all over the world are being performed on the Warsaw stage, often frivolous and insignificant, we are doing nothing to get to know the soul of a people with whom we have been destined to live. Jewish theatre deserves more attention. There was no time for that, however. The war broke out. In the Polish army, Jewish soldiers gained the respect of their commanders. And suddenly everything grew quiet. In fact, the silence was deafening. Warsaw surrendered. We did not know the worst war of all had hardly begun. When Warsaw capitulated, there were approximately 360,000 Jews in Warsaw. The first persecutions of Jews began shortly after the capitulation. That day, Jewish labor for the occupiers began. Soon, Jews were made to wear white bands with a six-pointed Star of David. Adam Chernyakov, the head of the Judenrat, wrote in his diary. By eight o'clock in the morning, I was brought an armband with the Star of David. Thus I received my new badge of honor. I told the Gmina to have a stamp made with the Shield of David. The occupiers blocked Jewish bank accounts, took away from the Jews their houses, workplaces, shops. The sick were forced to leave the hospitals. In December 1939, schools for Jewish children were closed, and in 1940, synagogues too were closed, and group prayer in private homes forbidden. For many months, the occupiers considered a project to create a Jewish ghetto in Warsaw, including its plan and location. In the end, it was decided to create a ghetto in the very heart of this metropolis. Work had begun on construction of the wall, 
The Jewish masons, guarded by German soldiers, laid brick after brick. On October the 2nd, 1940, the governor of the Warsaw district signed a decree declaring the creation of a Jewish residential district. The Jewish ghetto was officially founded this day. The Jews were forbidden from leaving its borders, delimited by certain streets. A rumour circulated that Vronia Street, rather than Jelazna, was to be the border and that Chienna was under threat. People ran to and fro in confusion. The day the ghetto was sealed off was terrible. People did not yet know this was going to happen and the news came as a shock. The ghetto has been sealed off for a week already. The red brick walls surrounding the ghetto have grown much higher. Pandemonium breaks out in our doomed neighborhood. The ghetto's borders were changing. In late October and early November 1941, some streets were excluded from the ghetto, which divided it into two parts, walled off from the rest of the city. This left 75,000 people without a roof over their head. From that time on, there were two close cities within the heart of Warsaw. The occupiers crowded over 100,000 Jews into the Warsaw Ghetto, most of whom had been resettled from the vicinity of Warsaw. These people, robbed of their belongings, were hungry and homeless. The sight of these people is shocking. The abused and hungry unfortunates have not slept for several days and their feverish eyes are filled with fear. The Nazis did not succeed in cutting the ghetto off completely from the rest of the city. From the economic point of view, it was to remain a part of Warsaw, just one that happened to be starving and slated for annihilation. Schmuggier began between the city's two parts, the smuggling of illegal goods under or over the ghetto walls. On December 31st, a Jewish woman was shot on the corner of Niska and Zemenhof streets as she was trying to get out from the ghetto. Nevertheless, hundreds of people succeed in crossing to the other side, where they buy food. It was small children who would go through holes in the wall because it was only the smallest who could fit through the concealed holes in the wall dividing the Aryan side from the ghetto. The gendarmes who guarded the wall often shot at these children. When the twitching bodies had stiffened, the guards would go back to eating their breakfast with gusto. In the cellars and attics of buildings inside the ghetto, there were mills, bakeries and workshops producing clothing, soap, material, leather, buttons, spools and even toys. Most of the items made there were for exports, for the Aryan side.
Things were produced in the ghetto in the most appalling conditions, in dark, miserable rooms. People sat bent over stools on benches, bent over tables and machines, sewing clothes and underclothes, caps, mattresses and quilts, making dolls, toys, sundries, flypaper, combs, safety pins, snaps, homespun cloth and brushes. The means of production were very archaic. Technological progress had taken a step backwards. The workers employed in these enterprises could not afford to acquire items that were being smuggled. In the ghetto, there were also people for whom nothing was lacking, except freedom. Goebbels' propaganda assiduously made the most of these social contrasts. While the impoverished ghetto was starving, a handful of war profiteers coalesced. The new elite, who tried to forget what was happening by keeping themselves entertained. Beginning in the spring of 1941, the Germans set up production enterprises in the ghetto. The shops, which were based on the inhumane exploitation of Jewish workers. Hunger takes on ever more monstrous proportions. The price of food keeps going up. There are many children dressed in rags on the streets. They are begging. 80% of all children in the area set aside for refugees are also begging. On Leshna Street, every few feet, one can see people lying in the nooks of the wall, begging. Small children are sitting on the sidewalk in the snow, dressed in rags. Their small, sunken-in faces look like those of corpses. In the evening, one can hear the constant wailing of the children. The most terrible sight of all is that of children who are freezing, with bare feet and legs, dressed in rags, as they stand on the street and cry. Janusz Korczak and others like him tried to tend to the needs of the ghetto's smallest, most tragic victims. But children were not the only ones doomed to this tragic fate. It's not easy to cross the street carrying a package. When a hungry person sees someone with a package that appears to contain food, he follows him and at the right moment grabs the package out of his hands, opens it and begins to satiate his hunger. No, these people are not thieves. They are simply people who have gone mad with hunger. The sight of frozen human bodies on the streets becomes increasingly common. On Leshno Street, in front of the court building, Many mothers sit with their children wrapped in rags, whose little frostbitten legs are exposed. Sometimes a mother will embrace a child who has frozen to death and tries to warm the small, dead body.
Sometimes a child will draw close to its mother, trying to wake her, thinking that she has fallen asleep when she is actually dead. The Warsaw Ghetto. Poverty, hunger and horrendously bad hygiene have given rise to atrocious conditions. There are a number of special houses where the poorest of the poor live, where death reaps its biggest harvest. For example, in the building at 46 Miwa Street, where 500 people currently live, 233 previous residents have already died of hunger and disease. At 63 Pavia Street, 450 people have died. At 21 Krokmalna Street, where 400 people are living, the same number has died up to nine. 400. From October 1939 to mid-July 1942, approximately 100,000 Jews died, mostly from hunger and disease. A significant portion of the educated workforce was suffering from unemployment and hunger. But it was also this group that was most active in the organisation of self-help activities. Enormous reserves of social energy were released among the Jews, who were squeezed into the ghetto's borders. Building committees took shape that fed hungry children or organised mutual aid services provided by neighbours in different professions. In the ghetto, spontaneous efforts were made to help the hungry and sick, which took place behind the facade of openly operating institutions. These efforts were focused on numerous organisations providing social services. For example, CENTOS took care of orphaned children. The building committees, for example, helped hungry neighbours and people helped the deportees who had come to Warsaw from their hometowns and villages. Hunger did not overshadow the intellectual needs of those living in the ghetto. Even in this tragic situation, people wanted books and knowledge, music and prayers. Participating in culture and creativity gave them added strength to fight for their survival and was for them a form of spiritual resistance. It was only in September 1941 that the Nazis allowed six primary schools to be opened. But secret elementary and high school programs, as well as university ones, had been going on for one year already. In early 1942, a school reader called Chitanka was published. In it, one can find themes of hope, longing and love of one's family. The fields and forest, the Warsaw beyond the ghetto walls, all these were things that both children and adults were yearning for. I don't know whether children know small sisters of grain in the field. They grow in the wide fields, blue and red, sometimes yellow, and the kinds they want and the kinds you like. The world is so big, there just is no place for us in it. And I, when night falls, in order to level everything and wipe away the traces, I come to the window in the dark and gaze, gaze with hunger in my eyes, and I steal extinguished Warsaw 
I steal the silhouette of the town hall. At my feet lies theatre square. The moon, on his watch, turns a blind eye to sentimental smuggling. Warsaw, answer me, I am waiting. Today, Romek and I went to a premiere at the Femina Theatre. It was a musical comedy about life in the ghetto today, entitled Love is Looking for a Place to Live. Several dozen outstanding musicians, former members of the Philharmonic and Warsaw Opera and Polish Radio Orchestras were also in the Warsaw Ghetto. Performances took place in various concert halls. The proceeds often went to charity. This was all to disappear, however, along with the people who created and cultivated that cultural life, as they tried in vain to save themselves. One of these people was Emmanuel Ringenblum, who along with his colleague collected and safely hid away archives that today allow us to discover what it was like during those days, weeks and months in the ghetto in Warsaw and elsewhere. Despite the isolation, the Warsaw Ghetto was receiving news from all over Poland about the Jews' fate. Liaison officers from underground organizations, most often attractive young women, managed to reach even distant towns. In addition, letters from family members often made it into the closed ghetto. After October 1941, the Warsaw Ghetto had to live with the knowledge that the ghettos of other Polish cities were being liquidated. Jews began to be rounded up and killed. The perpetrators shot their victims with rifles, then covered them with a thin layer of soil, over which the next group of condemned would tread to their deaths. In late January and early February 1942, farewell letters began arriving in the ghetto from Jews just before their deportation to the death camp in Chelmano on the Neer River. To my beloved relatives, I'm sending you news of the terrible things that have happened near our town. Four weeks have passed since all the Jews were taken from Koro men, women and children. They were taken to an unknown destination. Then the same thing happened in Dambia, Quadava and Izbica. This week, escapees from there arrived here. They tell us that the people there are killed and poisoned with gas and 50 to 60 people are buried in one hole. My dear parents, write how my dear mother is feeling. And now, my dears, you must know from auntie that men, women and children have been taken from the entire district. Here, things are still calm, but it will come any moment to us too. I greet you all. May the dear Lord protect you. Dear mother, do not despair. And in May 1942, a German film crew arrived in the ghetto to make a propaganda film about Jewish life in the ghetto. In Lublin, approximately half of the ghetto's population was killed and a huge number was taken away to an unknown destination. At that time, this unknown destination was still the death camp in Belzec. People died in huge numbers there, while the German film crew was in full swing. Avril appeared with the film crew and demanded that the ritual baths on Jelna Street be filmed. For this, 20 men were needed, orthodox men with side curls and 20 upper-class women. 
and a circumcision ceremony was also required. We are not ashamed of this. This is not an affront to our honor. This does not humiliate us. It is the depraved and cruel who are disgraced by it. Tomorrow, there's supposed to be a ball in a private apartment, arranged at the request of the German filmmakers. The ladies will be in long evening gowns. The streets of Lublin are still flowing with blood and the victims have not yet been collected. The houses are full of corpses. The filmmakers look around a Jewish restaurant. They requested that food from the buffet be brought to the table. After lunch, they filmed a staged funeral there. We thank God that we are healthy, but we do not know how to manage, and we do not know what we should do. You should know about this. In general, you should know that uncle intends to hold a wedding at your house soon, and he already has an apartment nearby, very close to yours. That was the first coded warning about the construction of a death camp at Treblinka. The people in the ghetto could not have known the secret decisions being made in the quiet of exclusive Berlin offices. But in late March and early April 1942, after the Lublin ghetto had already been liquidated, the Warsaw ghetto underground learned of the Nazi plan to annihilate the Jews completely. The underground organizations of various hues and political orientations agreed that preparations should be made for armed resistance. The Warsaw Ghetto's days were already limited, however. The great action was approaching, the extermination of the Warsaw Jews. Morning, 7.30 at the Gmina. We were informed that, with certain exceptions, Jews, regardless of age or sex, were to be deported to the East. Adam Chernyakov knew that deportation to the East meant mass extermination. Unwilling and unable to partake in this, he committed suicide on April the 23rd, 1942. They demand that I kill my own people's children with my own hands. All that remains is for me to die. At dawn, patrols of Ukrainians and Lithuanians, led by SS soldiers, surround the ghetto. Umschlagplatz, all of us here are already half dead, dying and dead together with those who are alive. In a word, terrible, monstrous, a live, quivering grave. Scenes of people being loaded into railroad cars, the fervor of the Jewish police, parents being torn from their children, wives from their husbands, the shooting of those on the square who tried to escape that night. The Germans are demanding 5,000 people every day. The panic in the ghetto is indescribable. People, with bundles in their arms, are running in the streets, not knowing what to do with themselves. On July the 28th, 1942, the Jewish Fighting Organization was established, which took on its final form on December the 2nd of that same year. We were told that they are taking the people from a nursery school, a pharmacy, Korchak's orphanage, the dormitories on Sliska and Tvarda streets, and many other places. I proposed to Korchak that he go with me to the Gmina to try to convince them to intervene. He refused. He did not want to leave the children, even for one minute. The cattle cars began to be loaded.
This is how one of the noblest, most honest people ever to walk this earth met his death. Between July the 22nd and September the 21st, 1942, 300,000 inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto were taken to Treblinka. 35,000 Jews remained within its reduced borders. These Jews were given a temporary stay of execution. In addition to them, there were also 35,000 wild, i.e. unofficial, residents who remained in the ghetto. Why were 10% of Warsaw's Jews allowed to stay? Attempts have been made to answer this question more than once, upon which the answers to the following questions also depend. How long will they leave us in the ghetto? How long will they let us live? Will they let us live? And when will they do away with us? In what remained of the ghetto, people sensed the contrast between the beautiful glow of the autumn of 1942 and the permanent presence of death. Women and men from families that had been separated drew closer together. Listen, this night, shrouded in darkness as if it were a coat. I will come to you, and you know, for that one moment, when I'll bend down and touch you with my lips. The bullets at the fronts will stop in mid-air, and traffic will stop dead in the streets. The last months in what remained of the Warsaw Ghetto passed in feverish preparations for armed revolt. On January the 18th, 1943, SS detachments and the police entered the ghetto. They unexpectedly met with the determined resistance of the Jewish fighting organization. Surprised and disorientated, the Nazis, with casualties, retreated. We came out of our hiding places and shot at the enemy with pistols and rifles. Rivulets of German blood flowed down the streets of the ghetto. Hear, O oh German God, how the Jewish are praying in their wild houses, holding a crowbar pole in their hands. We implore you, O oh Lord, let there be a bloody battle. We beg you for a violent death. Before we perish, let our eyes not see how the tracks trail behind us. But let us, O oh Lord, take good aim. The Germans returned to the ghetto three months later to launch the complete extermination of its residents. On April the 19th, 1943, over 2,000 well-armed German and Ukrainian soldiers entered the ghetto, supported by artillery and air. They were met with the resistance of approximately 700 insurgents armed with pistols, hand grenades and a few machine guns. Ci hitlerowscy 16 kwietnia o godzinie 4 nad ranem przystąpili do zlikwidowania znaną nam metodą resztę getta warszawskiego, gdzie wygetowało jeszcze kilkadziesiąt tysięcy Żydów. Ludność żydowska doprowadzona do rozpaczy stawiła bohaterski opór zbrojny. Od tego czasu walka trwa. From April the 19th to the 24th, the heaviest fighting took place on the corner of Nalewki and Gęcia streets. On Zamunhof street, and within Świętojerska, Wołowa, Franciszkanska, and on Leszno, Nowolipki, Niska, Wołinska, and Szczęśliwa streets. The battle in the ghetto is for your freedom and ours. The plan to swiftly quash the uprising failed. Because of the insurgents' resolve and heroism, the leader of the SS and police, General Jürgen Strop, decided to burn the Jewish quarter along with its inhabitants and then raise it to the ground. The ghetto was engulfed in a sea of flames. The defenders of the ghetto either died in the flames or were forced by the fire to leave their bunkers and hiding places, and then perished in the extermination camps. The uprising in the ghetto was the first armed rebellion in a city in occupied Europe. For a month, the poorly armed handful of boys and girls resisted the powerful German military detachments. The ghetto burned. Its defenders perished. 
But morally, the insurgents triumphed. Their unequal battle had shaken the world's conscience. As the result of the extermination plan that had been carried out for several years against the Jews, the Warsaw Ghetto and its inhabitants ceased to exist. Today is your birthday, Ryshenka, dearest little daughter of mine, my only one. You are gone. You went with them into the dark abyss. What did you think during your hour of death, Ryshenka, even your golden braids cut off that I hid for so long from other people's eyes? In the end, they too burned in the Warsaw Ghetto. Today, you would have been 13. No one will call me mummy anymore.